But now I want you to think way back, way back to when you woke up this morning, no a long time. You probably flipped on the light switch, unplugged your phone from the charger, probably turned on the coffee pot and got ready for the day. Some of you probably got in your car, drove to the gas station, fueled up, or maybe some of you even unplugged your car from the charger. But how many of you stopped to think about where your energy comes from? Probably not very many of you. We just expect it to be there. Most of us don't even really think about it until our electricity bill starts to approach that of our cell phone bill. But the fact of the matter is, we usually don't think about energy until we don't have it or can't afford it. I think for me, I really started to think about energy in about 1997 after my first failed attempt at college uh, when I joined the Minnesota Army National Guard. I trained as a truck driver, fueler, combat engineer, and it's then that I started to recognize the nexus of energy and conflict. Here's me in uh, uh, military gear. Uh, after joining the, uh, the uh, after several years in the military and working on a variety of jobs, I moved in the summer of 2001 to Grand Forks, North Dakota, with the goal and vision of working uh, on energy. So I wanted to enroll as a geological engineer at the University of North Dakota. And then September 11th happened, and absolutely everything changed. National security, energy security, all came at the forefront of our minds, and our way of life was threatened like it hadn't been since the bombing of Pearl Harbor nearly 60 years earlier. So with the Middle East and continued turmoil and the continued threat of terrorism, the Iraq war broke out in March of 2003. And in June of that year, I re-enlisted with the North Dakota Army National Guard with the full uh, expectation that I would deploy to the Middle East somewhere. And in December of 2003, about halfway through my time at UND, I was deployed to Iraq with some of the finest individuals uh, and soldiers that I've ever met from the state of North Dakota. Our job was to drive up and down the main supply routes that were hauling energy and water, and to look for roadside bombs, uh, known as IEDs. And this really had a profound impact on me. So then when I returned from Iraq in February 2005, I married my best friend. I started back at UND with a renewed focus and desire to make a difference in energy. I ended my time in the military after nine years, and then eventually in August of 2007, I graduated from UND, and I applied for a job as a research scientist at the Energy and Environmental Research Center. And during that, during that interview, I was asked why I want to work at the ERC, to which I replied very confidently at the time that I wanted to work on developing energy here in the United States so that my future kids and grandkids wouldn't have to go halfway around the world to fight for energy security. Here they are right now. Apparently that was a good answer because I was hired and started work the next day. And during my time at the EERC, I've had the incredible privilege to work with over 200 brilliant scientists and engineers and a number of industry and government leaders to advance energy technologies here in the United States. Also during my time at the EERC, we refocused on our people, our partnerships, and our priorities and established a new vision to lead the world in developing solutions to energy and environmental challenges. Now this really spoke to me. This is exactly the reason that I wanted to work at the EERC in the first place. And this grand vision is the same one that's attracted all of those bright minds to work at the EERC. And it's the same vision that's attracted industry and government to come to the EERC to help them solve those really big challenges like cracking the code on production of oil and gas from the Bakken, pioneering technologies in hydrogen, biofuels, uh, batteries, rare earth elements, clean coal technology, and what's helped us become a global leader in North Dakota in carbon capture utilization and storage. And so working on all these different technologies here in North Dakota and other places around the country, something amazing happened in about 2019. For the first time since the 1940s, the United States became energy independent, meaning we started producing more energy than we consumed. 
And this has an incredible implication for all of us and all of our lives. In this way, we are able to sell energy to our friends and allies as opposed to buying it from our adversaries. If you think back to the time that I was in Iraq, 2005 is when I returned. At that time, the United States consumed 44% more energy than we produced. So all of that was driven by technology and technology revolutions, helping us solve those challenges to be able to produce the resources that we had in the United States, to be able to supply those to our allies. And ever since 2019, we have been energy independent, producing more energy than we consume. If we look at the EIA data from 2021, we can see that our energy mix is about 79% fossil fuel based, with only a small portion of that coming from renewable energies. And even still today, we see much the same picture, and if we look around the globe, we would see again this very similar picture. But now we are talking about something different. The rhetoric has changed, not from one of energy security or energy independence, but one of carbon management, and one of an energy transition in which we are supposed to shift away from our traditional fuel sources to renewable energy sources. I think it's important to understand the challenge here. How do we provide reliable, affordable energy with intermittent energy sources? The answer today is that we can't. However, if we shift the way we are thinking about this problem, we shift and embrace an energy transformation by which we use all of our resources cleanly, we can achieve that today. And what I mean, you know, what I mean by clean is removing carbon emissions and carbon and greenhouse gas emissions, we can do that right now with utilizing the resources that we have today. Things like carbon capture and storage on fossil fuel resources, expanding the use of nuclear. And we can also transform our transportation sector utilizing electric vehicles and also hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Again, that electricity coming not just from renewable sources and that hydrogen, but also from fossil fuel resources with uh, carbon capture and storage on, locked on the back. Also important to understand is location, because every location has different potential and different resources. If we look at North Dakota, we have abundant renewable resource opportunity, we have abundant fossil fuel resources, and also the ability to store hundreds of billions of tons of carbon dioxide in our subsurface. Now, if we look across the border into Minnesota, the picture looks different. They don't have that same geology, the potential to store carbon dioxide or produce fossil fuels, but they have abundant nuclear energy, as well as renewable source resources. And working together, we can meet that reliable, affordable, clean energy goal. Likewise, if we look around the globe, they have different resources too. For example, in Africa and Southeast Asia, countries there have different resources, different potential, and they're gonna need different solutions to be able to maintain energy independence and energy security. Right now on the planet, we have about eight billion people and over a quarter of those people today are living in energy poverty, as defined by the fact that they either don't have energy and or they can't afford that energy. By 2060, it's expected that we will have over 10 billion people on planet Earth. And they are, most of that growth is gonna happen in those countries that I talked about before, the continents of Africa and Southeast Asia, or again, many of them are already living in energy poverty. They too are going to want uh, reliable, affordable, clean energy. Really, they just want any energy period because they want to improve their quality of life. But we have an incredible opportunity and actually a responsibility here in the United States to produce all of our energy resources, do it cleanly, producing a reliable, affordable energy. And if we do that, if we embrace an energy transformation by utilizing our resources, using them cleanly, applying the best technology of the day, we'll be able to provide clean, reliable, affordable energy, and then not have to choose between clean and reliable. Thank you very much.